Dr. Marcus Conan, thank you so much for joining me on the first episode of The Cure Chronicles. Uh, you have an amazing background. You're one of the early people who were involved in the uh, HIV AIDS epidemic. This goes all the way back to the 1980s. And uh, please tell us how you ended up getting involved with HIV back in those days. I was a young professor at the university in San Francisco studying herpes. And suddenly a whole new disease uh, appeared, a disease that we now was, know was caused by a herpes virus, Kaposi sarcoma. And I started a clinic at the university. We collected these patients and started studying them. You, you know that Kaposi sarcoma was caused by herpes virus? Yes. Oh, we okay. know that now. We didn't oh, know then. All right. Interesting. And, uh, but Carposi sarcoma is always thought of as being a symptom of uh, HIV. Right. But, but it's a consequential symptom. That's huh? right. Remember, HIV is really a disease of the immune system. Uh, the virus destroys your immune system and allows other infectious diseases to appear. Interesting. So what happened is, is that HIV could, could allow herpes to get out of control or at some level where it would inspire a that type of sarcoma. That's correct, exactly. Oh, now, of course, to be clear, uh, Kaposi sarcoma is not caused by HHV1, which mm -hmm. causes cold sores. It's called by, caused by HHV8, an entirely different herpes virus. Which is, is fairly rare? Or? Turns out that there are lots of people infected with it, but as long as they have a normal immune system, it doesn't cause a problem. Wow, that is fascinating, right? So this was like an early indication that this was acquired immune deficiency syndrome, Precisely. that that's what was going on. And HIV, wow, what an amazing mystery to have to crack. But, I mean, at that point, it must have been all mystery. So what was it like to be on the front lines at that moment as, you know, you were starting to see, what, increasing amounts of Carposi sarcoma and other things? What were you seeing? Well... There, there are two answers to the question. As a member of the community, it was frightening because people were getting this disease and we didn't know what was causing it. We didn't know why they were getting it. Mm -hmm. And later, of course, they started dying. But as a physician interested in virally transmitted diseases that cause skin disease, it was fascinating because it was an opportunity to, dis to discover and study an entirely new disease. Mm -hmm. How many doctors have a chance in their lifetime to discover and work on an entirely new disease. Well, not all physicians are also involved in research and, and, and you know, interested in research. A lot of them are just treating patients and will do that their whole life long. But you were at that nexus of academia and also uh, dermatology. And so you actually were somebody that had a research interest in viruses, yes. it sounds like, and how that, uh, and the implications for cutaneous disease, Yes. right? Wow. And so you just happened to be right at that focus point, and, and what was it like to be there at the moment that HIV started to rear its head? Well, at that moment, when it started, we had no idea that it, these patients were going to go on and develop other diseases that were caused by the decaying immune system. We had no idea that they were going to get pneumocystis pneumonia and die. We had no idea that it was going to suddenly start affecting hundreds of thousands of gay men. We had no idea that 94% of them would die of this disease. Think mm -hmm. about that. Right now we have, we have a COVID epidemic that kills 2%. And yeah. this disease killed 94%. Right, of the people that were infected. Correct. Right, which is another reason why people wanted to disassociate themselves with that community, to believe that it was only within that community, to you know, bury their head in the sand and you know, sort of hope and wish it away. Right. I mean, that is absolutely frightening to have to deal with that concept. And, and interestingly enough, Jeff, people had talismans that protected them. We have stories of men who would still go to the bathhouse and have sex, mm -hmm. but they take a shower each time they had sex. And Are, that's all, oh, talismans, in other words, like rituals that made them believe that they were somehow going to be immune to pre this thing. Precisely. Wow. Yeah, I mean... It's, uh, it's 1980s all over again with COVID in a lot of ways, but you're right, because of the low death rate in COVID, you know, this is a different calculus, but amazing that there's some relationship between, you, uh, you know, now and then. 
So what did you do for these patients? Because you said they came in with all these skin diseases, but you didn't realize that this was something that was going to kill them eventually. So initially, you're seeing all these things, and what are you doing? Just treating them like they're, uh, you know, unusual skin diseases and giving them antibiotics and, and what? I mean, what do you do for them? Well, what we were really doing was collecting information. We were studying what's causing this, you know, mm -hmm. looking at their blood work. What abnormalities could we find? Talking to them about their sexual practices. What were you doing that might be different? Huh. Because we thought that there might be some environmental thing was causing it. Right. There, there was a drug that was very common in gay men, uh, amyl nitrate, which they use as a sexual stimulant. But it's called poppers. Uh -huh. And so there was a thought that, well, maybe using poppers is the reason this is happening to gay men. Yeah. So all of that data was being collected and looked at. So you have a mystery disease, and you're basically a detective trying to solve a mystery, but against the backdrop of the mysteries not being solved and the situation's getting worse. Did you see it accelerating in, in, in the early 80s? Yes. And, of course, as a physician involved with it, you look at how can I approach this disease, you, and you think about it, I can approach it by trying to make society understand it as well as possible, to try to make the drug companies understand it as much as possible, and to try to make politicians understand it. And let's think about that. I started the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. That was to try to help the public to understand it. I reached out to drug companies to try to get studies done, and we did do a lot of drug studies. And I testified before Congress a dozen times. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to do all the three things that you do when you have an epidemic. So you realized it was an epidemic. Right. At some point you realize this is a communicable disease and this means that it has the characteristics of a, of a viral outbreak and that you had to deal with it. And so you started all these different initiatives. Uh, who were the other stakeholders in this that were alongside of you? Well, we, among the physicians that I was working with, we started a clinic where we were seeing patients, but I started a group that would come in after the patients. They'd come in from uh, 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock, and I had gastroenterologists and dentists even, epidemiologists, uh, oncologists. Paul Voberding mm -hmm. co-chaired that clinic with me. He and Paul ended up opening the clinic at San Francisco General. Mm -hmm. Don Abrams was involved in that clinic. He ended up doing some of the early work in looking about lymph node syndrome because many of these guys when they first got infected would get swollen lymph nodes. So there were lots and lots of people, many mm. of whom went on to very illustrious careers. So a whole team of forensic scientists basically, you know, trying to help solve this mystery that were all motivated, you know, sort of in different ways to come and collect together in this group. And your arc into it was as a uh, dermatologist who had a particular research in interest in viral drivers of uh, dermatological conditions. Exactly. What sort of time frame are we talking about here where this continued to be a mystery and where it continued to be accelerating? Well, we, we started seeing the first cases in the spring of 1981. The clinic was started later that year. I started the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, what became the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, uh, in 1982, and the number of cases continued to grow. We finally realized that this was a fatal disease about 1985, 86. By that time, enough people who were getting the disease were progressing to die right. that it became obvious that this, this is, a, is a fatal disease. Hmm. It was not, I can remember clearly, 1987 was clear that we were not going to get a vaccine. Because early on, remember, we thought this is a virus. Yeah. We're going to get a vaccine like any other virus. Come sure, on, man. Sure, sure. As soon as we identify this, it'll be gone. Sure, exactly. Yeah. And so the, we had, the virus had been uh, cultured by Montagnier and Gallo. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was 83, 84. Uh, by, by 1985, they announced that they had the virus. But by 1987, it was obvious that even though we had the virus, we couldn't make a vaccine. Okay. Now, this is really interesting to say this to a doctor instead of a scientist, but I bet you can give us a great answer on this. Why was a vaccine so hard? Why because, couldn't it be done the same way? But, well, because it's, it's complex. Because to, to remember, to make a vaccine, what you're trying to do is to, 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 to head off what the virus normally does. If you catch measles, mm -hmm. you get sick for about 10 days, two mm -hmm. weeks. Okay? Why? Because once you're exposed to that virus, your body has to make the antibodies 
against the measles virus. And T-cell reactions right, as well, I was right? Gonna say, and not only does it make the antibody, but it makes cells which actually kill the infected cells, mm -hmm. killer, killer the T-cells. That takes about 10 days. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, you could head that off by exposing people to a little bit of the virus, a dead piece of the virus, mm -hmm. and letting their immune system figure out how to make those antibodies before you're exposed to the virus. And that's, also to condition their T cells to be ready right. for it, that's right? What, that's what a vaccine does. Right. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay. So a vaccine basically prepares your immune system in advance for the pathogen, right? right? Okay. So why doesn't this work with HIV? Uh -huh. But with HIV, you've got a problem because not only do antibodies not work, probably because the spacing on the virus is so wide, but the T cell response doesn't work because the virus kills the T cells faster than the T cells can kill the virus. Well, do all viral pathogens kill T cells? Some do, but, but not the way that HIV does. Mm -hmm. HIV specifically kills the T cells that target the HIV infected cells. So in other words, like HIV will attract over the thing that's supposed to kill it and prep your body for it and then infect that. And then kill it before it can kill the AIDS virus. So it can actually get ahead of that. So eventually HIV wins. So does that mean, so how does that impact the vaccine? So having larger numbers of those cells doesn't help? No, because if you grow up a large number of those cells and you put them in the patient and that's been done, the AIDS virus kills them off before they can do anything. So it's almost like there's just more targets for the HIV virus, That's right. right? The more you have of those T cells that HIV likes to kill, yeah. and the more you, targets. And as you know, that's what you guys do. You have protected those T cells. That's exactly what AGT does. So here we are at 87 and we realize, okay, we're not going to get a vaccine and people are dying. Uh, how long did that situation persist? I mean, when did we get to the point? Because we know that people can get HIV now, and you see on TV ads all the time, and, you know, they, they actually look happy to have HIV, you know, because they're taking a pill and they're having fun with their friends. Um, but, you know, when did we get to the point where it wasn't a death sentence anymore? Because what you're telling me is in 1987, you found out you had HIV, you pretty much expected to die. Yeah, that's right. Well, fortunately, there had been research done Trudy Ellen got a Nobel Prize for it, to find out that you could block viral infections. It, it, before the uh, 1960s, we thought you could never uh, block a virus. But we found out that you could interrupt a virus replication with certain drugs which the virus doesn't understand, takes up in, instead of the nucleotides that they need to replicate and makes an abnormal chain and the virus can't replicate, a chain terminator, if you will. Now that had already been done for herpes simplex. And so, by so what what was done? What, so that's, before the a HIV epidemic, they already had a herpes simplex sort of blocker. Correct. Oh, that, okay. That's exactly right. Re remember that acyclovir, which was the first drug for herpes simplex, mm -hmm. is an acyclic guanosine. Mm -hmm. So to replicate, the virus takes up the guanosine that you eat and makes the virus. If you feed the patient an acyclic guanosine, the virus, the herpes virus, takes that up but it can't replicate that chain, right. the, the DNA. It's got something else attached it's to got it something that blocks else, the... And it blocks it. So that's a chain yeah. terminator. Got it. So what they started doing was looking for a chain terminator that would block this virus that causes AIDS. So what year was that when they started looking and, and they did they find looking, something? Yes. Uh, they started looking in the late 80s, and by 1988, they found AZT. That's what it is. It seems like the, um, the, the perception of AZT was that it was temporary at best. Uh, yeah. Well, exactly. And it was very toxic. One of the AIDS oh, patients, an so activist, side effects that kind called, of it, that called it Drano in a pill. And mm -hmm. it was. It would make patients sicker than hell. But it did show that it would block the virus. Okay, so it was an experimental result that said at least blocking the virus is possible. That's right. exactly right. So what's the next so, step? So then? once you've got something that works, yeah. then you make that better. Right. You, That's you, the obvious yeah. thing. Right. And and of course the problem early on is they were making drugs that were better, three T C, D four T. All of these were chain terminators. Mm -hmm. But the problem was that all of them, it only took one mutation of the virus. Of the virus to, to beat escape the drug. It. 
Right, but right. then suddenly when they started getting different groups of drugs, like protease inhibitors, you could put a chain terminator and a protease inhibitor, both of which work through different mechanisms. Now the virus has to get two mutations simultaneously. Right. And we know how statistics works. It, it gets much harder. Much harder. It's in other words, the virus has to go through a very tough mutation to, to beat it. Some of the early, other drug, early drugs, though, uh, like 3TC, it only took one mutation, boom, the drug is lost. So this is what we hear about drug resistance, right? Right. So when did it get to the point where people are coming in who have HIV and there was a reasonable hope that you could find something that would be life extending, if not, you know, restore them to a normal, uh, you know, sort of life expectation? 19, 19, 1995. 15 years after, oh, no, 14 years after the epidemic started. That's right. You're We've telling me that in 1995, finally you felt like you had a decent tool set. Highly active antiretroviral therapy. Okay. Okay. And what, what's the difference between that and all the other things that you were describing? The, these were drugs where it took more than just one mutation, and now we had two or three drugs we could combine, and the virus had to really work hard to mm -hmm. beat that. And okay. suddenly with that, we found out that not only... Could you give them three drugs in combination? H yeah. Highly active antiretroviral therapy. This is the drug cocktail. Cocktail, as they say. right? Not only could you do that, but not, but their viral load would drop. Mm -hmm. Their capsid sarcoma would go away. They would uh -huh. start living without the progression to disease. Uh huh. Uh, and they could have sex without transmitting the disease. You knew all this back in '95. No, all oh, of that okay. was learned later. And many of us then call that the Lazarus Syndrome. These patients were like they were rising from the dead because they could be almost at end stage with only a few hundred T cells left and then suddenly it all stopped, it reversed. But the pills have side effects. Okay. The pills are not without problems. Right. Pills can cause demineralization of bone, uh -huh. can cause elevations of, of uh, fats in your bloodstream, can uh -huh. cause an increase in heart disease. So the pills are, are not totally benign. Okay. Okay? So, so they're facing two issues. If, we, if our audience wants to walk in their shoes for a moment, one issue is that they're taking a pill that has some side effects. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is these side effects build up over time. So Correct. there may be short-term side effects that we hear on the ads every night when we watch TV, which is, you know, nausea, diarrhea, and fatigue, mm -hmm. or headaches, right? But then there may be long-term consequences as well uh, that what I un understand, and I heard you said, you know, issues with fat and demineralization of bone. So I've heard... Kidney uh, problems. Kidney problems. So, yeah, I've heard liver, kidney, heart disease, extra cancers. Mm -hmm. I've heard uh, early aging, bone density issues, osteoporosis, brittle bones. That sounds like the bone demineralization issue. Okay, so certainly back in 1995, this was an issue. Is it still an issue? Yes, it's still an issue. Okay, so the modern drugs haven't gotten rid of those, you know, sort of long-term no, consequences. they're better, but they're not, okay. they're not eliminated. And then even if people are on those drugs, they still know that they've got this HIV in their body. So these are folks that still need help, even though there's something that will treat them for life. Mm -hmm. That, you know, there may be a way, you know, vaccines haven't worked out, and there have been, you know, something like 800 vaccine trials in HIV. Not so, only in this country, but all over the world. All over the world, right. And we identified why that's so difficult, is because you can go ahead and amplify the, the T cells that are responsible for controlling HIV, but the problem is, is that HIV has this advantage over the T cells in that it can infect them and kill them. Right. Well, there you go, right? You make more of them, that doesn't make a difference. All right, so that's why vaccines haven't worked out. But, you know, what's the strategy that you're seeing right now that might give some hope for, you know, sort of a new phase of the HIV, uh, you know, uh, therapy uh, arc? Well, you know, the goal is we know that AIDS is curable. The Berlin patient proved that AIDS is curable. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So the goal, obviously, is how can we cure this disease? Now, I don't know, what, what you know better than I is what AGT has done is come up with the next strategy in what we've been talking about. We know that there are these gag-specific T cells that will kill the HIV-infected cells, mm -hmm. but that HIV will kill those. So if we grow those up, it'll kill them. But what if you grew them up and you put a virus in them that had uh, uh, genes in that? 
which would block HIV. So in other words, you'd modify these T cells so that you could block HIV, and how would you do that? You, you would put genes in there, just like they did with the Berlin patient. With the Berlin patient, they gave him bone marrow that had a mutation that the AIDS virus can't infect, the CCR5 okay. mutation. So why don't we put that gene into the virus that we're infecting these T cells with, and, put, and while we're at it, why don't we put a couple more in there so that you've got three in there, so theoretically the virus can't mutate around that. Just like with the drugs. You know, you finally had to have used three drugs so that the virus couldn't mutate around it fast enough. So why don't we do the same thing with these T cells? Grow them up now. Now they're protected. The HIV virus can't kill them. Put that into patients, take them off of their drugs, and let's see if it kills the virus. So in other words, we would create T cells that couldn't be depleted, infected and depleted by HIV, but they were still HIV specific. Exactly. And so we would expect these HIV T cells to still go after the virus, just like normal HIV T cells do. Right. But when they meet the virus, they wouldn't lose the battle. That's exactly right. Okay, and if they don't lose the battle, what we hope is that they will actually clear the virus as opposed to succumbing to the virus. Right. Right. And now the T cells that uh, we're working with, which are called helper T cells, mm -hmm. right? These helper T cells are the target of HIV. Mm -hmm. They are the first T cell subset to be eliminated by mm -hmm. HIV, mm -hmm. but they all have two responsibilities, and not, that's not just to go out and hunt and kill HIV on their own, but they have a signaling system by which they inspire other levels of the immune system to react to the pathogen. Right. And those are CD8 cells and also B cells. Mm -hmm. So, you know, explain f to our audience why that would be helpful in terms of uh, protecting people from HIV. Because the CD4 cell is actually the conductor, if you will, of the immune uh, orchestra. You've got a whole system there where you have antibodies, the B cells that you alluded to make the antibodies, but you've got the cells that uh, ki kill, the, kill cells, natural killer cells, and you have memory cells. And so if you can grow up these cells and let them get in there and kill the HIV virus, maybe you will uh, restore the antibody response, the CD8 response, memory cell response, and allow the body's own CD uh, gag-specific T cells to be made again. We have seen from previous studies that some people have gone into durable remission from HIV, like the Berlin patient, and, and that was done with a bone marrow transplant. So the modification to his T cells came from somebody that just had a natural mutation that was beneficial. Exactly. But then we saw at Sangamo that they tried to do that modification using viral vectors, which That's is correct. you know what you were talking about, get a virus and put it in there with protection for HIV. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing was stripping a uh, receptor off the outside of the T cells that HIV uses to get in there. And then you also mentioned that AGT's approach has two other forms of protection, which block not only these R5 viruses that need that door handle to get into the cell, but block all known strains of That's HIV. Right. This experiment is worth doing. Yeah, exactly. No, no, yeah. the experiment is clearly worth doing. Because, yeah. the exp you know, this, is, this isn't science fiction. It's based on all of the previous research. Yeah. It's just the next obvious step. Right, right. So there's a whole arc of this uh, that comes from the discovery of CCR5, because there were some people that were just naturally immune, mm -hmm. and I think that right. discovery was made in Nairobi, of all places, right. right? That they saw that there were some people that weren't getting HIV, and they discovered that they had this mm -hmm. weird mutation. Mm -hmm. Okay, which was missing CCR5, which turned out not to be deadly, right? I mean, because there's a lot of genetic mutations where you, you can't have a normal <laughs> life. Lot, yeah. But these people had normal lives with one weird benefit that it was hard for them to get HIV. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then they did these bone marrow transplants that gave this superpower to people that received bone marrow from right. those folks, right. right? You're basically regrowing somebody else's immune system in this new person. Right. And, and that also, uh, you know, supported this theory that if you could do that, that you could create a cure, mm -hmm. right? And then Syngamo got that in a number of different, uh, a few patients, if I understand correctly, uh, by using gene therapy. Correct. This was the concept that you brought up of using a virus to go in there and make that modification. Instead of replacing the whole immune system, you could replace part of it Precisely. with cells that were missing their CCR5. And then AGT is adding to that by saying, okay, we can not only strip CCR5, but we can do it more reliably, 
As a matter of fact, I'll just throw a stat out there, but nine out of the ten cells that we infect with our virus come up with zero CCR5, right. where it was one in ten in the Sangamo study. Mm -hmm. So that's a big, you know, sort of reliability benefit. Uh, but also the dose of these CD4 cells that become protected by these three different methods mm -hmm. is actually 2,000 times the level of what was happening in this Sangamo study. Mm -hmm. So it's 2,000 times that. And... It's at one-tenth the cost, which makes it a little bit more practical. So we're in the midst of an experiment with the intent of curing this. And I think from our discussion we talked about it's still important to cure. Even though we have treatments now that will give somebody a normal lifespan and that actually removes them as a danger to the people around them, mm -hmm. right? Because if somebody's well-controlled, you know, we all agree, they're no danger even to their lover. Their intimate partner right. is no longer in danger of getting HIV. I mean, this should be something that everybody who's listening to this should understand from somebody who's an expert in this, right, is that well-controlled HIV-positive persons are nothing to fear. So, um, you know, what do you think? Where are we in this uh, thing? You're, you're running right now. I don't know if everybody that's watching this knows this, but one of the reasons you're our first guest is that it was just serendipity that I got to meet you and that we shared a passion for eradicating HIV in our lifetime. I mean, you obviously were just on the front lines for the last 40 years, but I saw a possibility of doing this with technology that was develop, being developed at AGT. And so we just, our paths just crossed and we shared a real passion for that, that cure agenda, mm -hmm. okay. So what did you do? You hopped on board, and thank you for doing that. You brought a lot of your clinical experience here, and you've been running our clinical program. So tell us where it's at. Where are we in well, this? Uh, in the, 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 this the, good, the good news is we take these, these gag-specific T cells we've been talking about, we protect them, we grow them up in huge numbers, and we take a patient, we take his own blood, we take his gag-specific T cells, we grow them up. So we're not putting anything foreign in this patient, we're putting his own cells back in the patient. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you take the cells, you by leukopheresis, you grow them up, you protect them, you put them back in the patient. We've done that now with five patients so far without any serious problem. There have been a couple of patients who've had transfusion reactions as we put it back in with fever, headache, mm -hmm. but that's gone. And that's, not, it, that's not a serious adverse event? Not at all. Not at all, people, okay. People have that from transfusions all the time. Sure, we, have, we hear people, you know, they get a COVID vaccine and get a reaction like Precisely. that. Precisely, yeah. so, so no, but that's all we've seen. And one of the patients go, has gone now for, it's close to nine months with absolutely no side effect. So in other words, they just feel like they felt before, right. but they, they have a, you know, a billion of these supercells inside of them. But those patients are still on their antiretroviral medication. Okay. So their virus is staying suppressed. Mm -hmm. Because and, of the antiretrovirals. Right, but for, okay. because of their medication. But now what will happen when we stop the medication? And so mm. that's the next step. Yeah. And so we're on the eve of doing that. That's correct. Yeah. We just got approval to do a protocol where we do antiretroviral treatment interruption, where we can take the patient off of their medicine, mm -hmm. follow them very closely. Fortunately, I've had some experience doing that because 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, Tony Fauci and Mark Illum and uh, uh, Mark Dibel and others thought, wouldn't it be interesting to, to have treatment interruptions? Because the drugs were so expensive, maybe patients don't need to take the drugs all the time. Maybe they only need to take it two weeks, go back on drugs for two weeks, take it for two weeks. That would cut the cost of drugs in half. Right. But it didn't work. I did some of those experiments back then 15, 20 years ago. So I've had some experience taking patients off. So with care, watching the patients very closely, we can monitor the virus if it's going to come back. So I'm very excited about taking them off now, now that they're protected with these uh, modified cells that AGT has made to see what will happen. What will be the kinetics of viral rebound? What we're hoping to see is the virus doesn't come back at all. Yeah, and there's theoretical reason to believe that because of the Berlin patient, because of the Sangamo patients, right? That there's experimental um, data in the past that shows that uh, achieving viral control that's equivalent to ART and keeps these patients non-infectious and with no fear of AIDS, right, right uh, is possible with sufficient number of modified cells. And so we're going to find out whether 2,000 times the Sangamo experiment, you know, has 2,000 times the effect or, it, or at least, you know, a higher effect. 
so a higher percentage of them will not need their antiretrovirals again. Because we saw some patients on the Singamo study that have not had to go back on antiretrovirals. And, and the patient's own body now is controlling their disease. Right. They're not having to take some artificial medication. They are controlling the disease themselves. And so they're not suffering the side effects of that exactly. medication. Precisely. Yeah. And furthermore, if this works, this opens a whole new area because what other diseases can we treat in the same way? Sounds like you're excited enough to even be dreaming about what other types of viruses we might control this of way. Of course. Wow. Okay, so uh, that's big news that, you know, uh, that we're going to be able to do a treatment interruption study. It's big news that you're excited. It's big news that you're on board here at the company, and thank you for that. And it's really exciting to hear about this whole, you know, sort of history of HIV from the initial uh, epidemic breakout and all the mystery and all of the detective work that had to be done by so many people in order to, in the mid-90s, get to a reliable treatment. And now we're in a new phase of the HIV arc that might result in a cure. And here you are again, working on that. And uh, very exciting uh, just story overall. We're going to have to visit with you again uh, you know, hopefully we're going to see a result in this and a celebration of, you know, achieving a cure. We, we can only cross our fingers and, and hope for that now, but we could also feel optimistic given the, given the data that we've seen so far. Um, but, you know, this is like uh, an incredible story arc from, you know, the discovery of this mystery disease maybe in your lifetime to a cure. And that would be great. That would be great. All right. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us. This was a fantastic to talk with you and a fantastic first uh, Cure Chronicles show. Thanks, Jeff.